We previously talked about agency problems, how a relationship between someone who gives a task and someone who receives the task may turn into a problem, and what can be done about that relationship, monitoring, bonuses, or bonding. I also talked about Henry Mintzberg's coordination mechanisms before, where I distinguished six different forms of organizing, and I promised you that I would connect these two ideas. Um, for an academic, that is an exciting endeavor to connect two theories uh, from different fields, one from financial economics, one from organization theory. To the average person watching this video, it is likely boring. Let's draw Henry Mintzberg's coordination mechanisms again. What you may recall is a shape that looked a bit like this. The operational core is at the bottom. That's where, the, where you find the people who do the work. Middle management is in charge of um, supervising these uh, people. So let's place a couple of people here. Um, and there's top management at the strategic apex of the organization. To the sides we find on the one hand the support staff, the people who support the work in the organization, and on the other hand the techno structure. These are the people who develop the rules for the people in the operational court. Let's first talk about a couple of forms that do not really warrant too much attention in this regard. Um, we talked about mutual adjustment in the innovative organization. This is the form of organizing where the top part of the graph is pretty much missing. And all we have is the bottom with people in a young organization um, who coordinate amongst each other without there being a clear leader. Um, there's not really a delegation of tasks going on there. There's no hierarchical order, so agency problems in this type of organization um, are generally not worthwhile discussing. Now, um, there are many other problems, of course, when you increase the number of people in the operational core in an innovative organization, you increase exponentially the number of uh, relationships among those people, and uh, thereby um, you make it increasingly more complex for them to mutually adjust. Uh, but that is not an agency problem. So I'm not going to discuss that one any further. Um, another form of organizing is the standardization of norms. which we came across in religious organizations. Where there's a common goal, common ideology that comes from the outside um, that standardizes the work um, in the organization. In many organizations, um, there's some kind of an ideology that leads to predictability of behavior. So in a, in a bank, for example, the ideology of capitalism Re results in predictability of behavior, whereas in a church organization it is the ideology re coming from the religion. In a hospital it is the ideology of the oath um, that, doctors, uh, that doctors sign. And that relates to agency problems to the extent that it makes opportunistic behavior less likely. Um, at least um, you can expect some non-opportunistic behavior from, uh, from your fellow um, colleagues. So, putting that aside as well, we have the four remaining forms of organizing. And let's first discuss the firm that, uh, that develops from the innovative organization, where usually the number of people in the operational core starts to increase um, as the product becomes more and more successful. When you have um, three people in the operational core, there are three relationships among them, um, when you add a fourth person, um, then you already have six relationships. When you add a fifth person, um, that increases to ten, etc. So the more and more staff members you add to the organization, the more relationships they have among each other, um, and the um, more 
problematic it becomes to coordinate across all these relationships. Hence, it is in the interest, um, I explained before, it is in the interest of the group to appoint someone to say, from now on, you are going to tell all of us how to behave. And that then suddenly reduces the number of relationships to only four, where, in this case with five notes, they used to be uh, ten. And if you want to, you can draw those ten. Now these, in the uh, what we then call um, direct supervision mode, where the organization takes the form of the entrepreneurial organization, this is where you see the classical um, agency problem popping up, where the principal assigns a task to the agent, um, and the agent may know better uh, what he's doing than the, than the principal, may have room to misbehave, and may have different um, objectives. Um, and it's this context where monitoring by the, uh, by the supervisor may be a solution to the principal agent problem or where the principal can tie the compensation of the agent to the performance of the agent. Now, of course, as the organization grows, direct supervision becomes increasingly complex as well. Um, one manager here only has two um, subordinates who need to report to him, but if you start adding um, staff members in the operational core, it becomes increasingly complex for the um, for the um, for the manager um, to oversee the work of all these staff members. Rather than there being one person who needs to oversee six staff members, note that if you would have an innovative organization with six um, staff members that you would have 15 relationships, so this already economizes on supervision, um, but you could further economize here by having a layer of middle management that oversees three staff members only. And here every manager, I'm sorry, there's middle management added, um, every manager um, oversees three members of the operational core and senior management oversees two middle managers. So if the organization grows again, then direct supervision becomes feasible if you add middle management to the um, to the organizational structure. That of course results in layered um, or multi-stage principal agent problems where there is one principal who is assigns a task to an agent and that agent may misbehave as we know um, under the conditions that apply um, and that agent then is also the principal of the two um, agents in the operational court, which again may be a principal agent relationship that is problematic. So, all right. What we also know from the organization theory um, clip is that at some point um, the processes of the organization will need to be standardized. And that is when the standardization of work comes in and when we start to talk about a techno structure. And that is this lobe to the left here. And the techno structure in Minsburg's formulation de develops guidelines, procedures, rules as to how work in the operational course should be performed. So the operational core receives instructions from the people in the techno structure who in turn receive instructions from the uh, manager at the top of the organization. And of course, there's also direct supervision involved. So in machine organizations like this, there's quite a complex um, um, structure. Um, the part of the instructions that the operational core receives are directly um, derived from what top management tells them to, um, or middle management, you could add middle management to this graph uh, as well, but part is also brought to the members of the operational core through the uh, techno structure. All right, we took out the techno structure in the graph um, and one immediately sees how important the techno structure is for many organizations as with taking out the techno structure we kind of ruined the depiction of the organization. So before you start cutting out rules in mature organizations, beware that they may be essential to the survival of the firm. 
Finally, what we have is um, the organization that is called the, um, um, the diversified firm. So the, the firm where standardization of results take place. And this is a complex one to draw. So what we can then kind of have is top management of headquarters, um, which directs members in different organizations um, that fall under the umbrella of the bigger corporation. So on the one hand there's relationships between the headquarters and top managers of the, um, of the organizations that make up the corporation. Um, so these three. There's also uh, relationships uh, between the top managers and the members of staff and the operational core in this organization. So um, the standardization of results is a relationship, a connection from top management of the diversified firm to top managers of the uh, daughter companies. And then within these daughter companies, there is again um, a, um, a principal agent relationship. So the top managers in the diversified firm, and the manager of the mother company that is, they gave, give instructions to the managers, the top managers of the, um, of the daughter companies, which in turn give instructions to the members of the operational core, so the um, employees of the daughter companies. Now, of course, um, there are many, many more um, agency relations possible in this um, form of organizing. Uh, so what we can have is principal agent relationships between the members of a techno structure and the um, employees of the um, of the daughter companies, between the management of the daughter companies and the techno structure of the daughter companies, between the management of the mother company and the management of the daughter companies, between the management of the mother company and the techno structure of the mother company, between the techno structure of the mother company and the techno structure of the daughter company, and to the extent that headquarters also prescribes how work is done in um, lower organizations, there can also be agency relationships between techno structure of the mother company and the uh, management of the daughter company, or even um, directly to the employees in the operational core. So in a diversified firm, there are many, many possibilities for principal agent um, problems. Now there's one remaining issue, and that is that of supervising the supervisor. The entire organization is run with the interest of a particular group in mind. Um, often traditional economics holds that this is, these are the, uh, the shareholders. Um, so the, um, the top managers of the organization should be accountable to the, uh, to the shareholders of the firm. Um, and as we know, in uh, a context of dispersed ownership, there are many, many um, shareholders of the organization, and there is only one CEO. And that person usually has um, an enormous advantage uh, information advance. She has a team of top managers um, surrounding himself, uh, which is often called the top management team, TMT. Um, each of these members have uh, direct relationships with the members of the operational core, and all this information coming from the operational core, the intermediate hierarchy, uh, perhaps also coming from the reporting that is part of the, uh, of the techno structure that also reports to the, to the CEO. All this comes together in the single person of the uh, chief executive officer, the CEO. So this person has an enormous information advantage over each of these individual shareholders. And um, if he would have um, different objectives, 
than the shareholders would want him to have, then immediately there is a very problematic principal-agent relationship going on here. And we know from the um, um, collective action problem that each of these shareholders has, as add a few more, uh, has a very limited motivation to supervise the, uh, the top manager. Um, if a single shareholder would monitor management, then the value of the firm may go up um, because the manager is no longer able to perform a behave opportunistically, but um, this and added value of the firm is shared with all the um, shareholders in the organization. So the individual shareholder in a dispersely held firm only gets a tiny share of the added value of his uh, monitoring. And so he will rely on the monitoring of all the others. That applies to the others as well. And as a result, um, no one ga engages in monitoring at all. So what happens in these firms is that there is a a board installed by law a board of directors B O D um, and this board of directors supervises the CEO and his top management team on behalf of the shareholders so the shareholders address, at least partly, their, um, their, their collective action problem by delegating their monitoring task to a selected group of highly experienced and directors. Often these are um, retired CEOs themselves. Now, of course, this doesn't entirely solve all the, uh, all the issues because um, who ensures that the board of directors behaves in the interest of all the shareholders, right? There again, uh, principal agent problems may arise. Um, and perhaps these, these directors, um, they don't really um, act in the interest of the um, shareholders, but are rather captured by the, um, by the CEO. Um, and that, that sometimes happens if you think about directors being former or even active managers in other firms, now, of course not in the firm itself, then it will be a member of the top management team, or um, the board of director members may still experience a, an information disadvantage with the top management team, in particular with the, with the CEO. So installing this board of director does not ensure that the entire collective action problem gets um, gets solved. It doesn't ensure that the, the room that the top management team has to maneuver to satisfy its own interests rather than the interest of the, uh, the shareholders is completely restricted. Um, so there's no possibility to behave opportunistically at all. That is not the case. But installing a board of directors who monitors the um, top management team on behalf of the shareholders is at least um, reducing the possibility of the top management team to behave opportunistically should it want to, uh, to do so. As long as the uh, directors negotiate at arm's length with the CEO, um, so they, um, they're independent persons from, uh, from each other, um, they don't um, have any concern other than their business concern um, in mind, um, then the board of directors would negotiate with the CEO um, the contract, the labor contract, including compensation and bonuses, that is in the best interest of the firm. All right, so this connects the um, Mintzberg's organization theory to the, um, the, the theory on principal-agent relationships and how they may become problematic. Um, I hope it wasn't as boring as I promised you it would be, um, um, and if not, um, then too bad for you.